Welcome everyone and thank you for joining us at this panel discussion at Euro Satori 2022. Our topic this afternoon is sustainability as a national security imperative. My name is Christiane Coda, and I'm the Director of Strategic Business Programs for Defense and Intelligence at Microsoft Canada. I'm pleased to be here with you, and Microsoft is honored to be an exhibitor with its partners here at Euro Satori this year. And I'm honored to share the stage with two respected guests from the industry whose organizations support and serve the global national security environment. In this session, we're going to discuss the role of digital technology in helping defense and intelligence organizations reach their sustainability goals, and more importantly, help their governments reach sustainability goals. We're going to discuss the impacts that climate change has on our national security and how we can adapt and better prepare uh, to be ready for them. Our panelists will share their thoughts on sustainability, common challenges associated with uh, meeting sustainability goals, and the role of industry in helping to address those challenges across the world. We shed some light on defense and intelligence organizations, on what steps defense and intelligence organizations can take to be more sustainable and more ecological. And we need to acknowledge that climate change is a real thing and that everyone needs to play um, their part in trying to solve this problem. With respect to our agenda, after I've introduced each of our panelists, I'll ask them to provide uh, a pers their perspective on what sustainability as the national security imperative means to them. Then we're going to spend 30 to 35 minutes on a panel discussion and that will be followed by an open Q&A Q um, portion of our program with you, our audience. We're looking forward to having an open and collaborative exchange with you and so let's get started. I'd like to introduce you to our two panelists. I'm going to start with providing, uh, providing you with their backgrounds and some context on who you're going to be hearing from today. My first panelist is Perry Smith from Myriad Technologies. With 30 years in technology and learning every day, Perry Smith works, currently works on the board of directors and previously as a managing director for Myriad Technologies and Sticks, progressing and learning how to lead and focus a complex organization specialized in information management. Previously, Perry was both the service delivery manager and client engagement manager, delivering innovative technology solutions and providing technology best practices and advice and guidance to businesses of all sizes in the areas of internet, intranet, document and records management and applications. So Perry, thank you for being here with us. My second panelist is Raphael Desi. Raphael Desi leads strategy, marketing, mergers and acquisitions, and partnerships for the Talis Global BU in charge of secure information systems and cybersecurity. He focuses on topics such as developing offers and partnerships on cloud, cyber, AI, 5G, and all of this so he can help build a future that we can all trust. Before joining Talis, Rafael was a partner and managing director in Boston Consulting Group's Paris office, uh, supporting leading companies in a large array of sectors from industry and energy to consumer goods, spending a large part of his time helping clients on digital transformation. So Rafael, we're very grateful that you're here to share your insights on this important topic. 
to begin, I'd like to provide each of our panelists with the opportunity to give us their perspective on sustainability as a national security imperative. And Perry, let's start with you. Please tell our audience what sustainability in the defense world means to you. Thanks very much. Nice to meet you, everyone, and thanks for joining us. So sustainability, I, I guess, the, there's the whole governmental debate, uh, intergovernmental debate and discussion around climate change. Whether or not you buy in or not does not change the fact that we have one planet and we would rather like to keep it and actually use it because Mars might be interesting, but I'd rather stay here if I'm honest about it. So from my perspective, um, the motivation for people doing the right thing and bringing the energies and time and effort of people together is the actual effect we're looking for. And I don't think there's huge amounts of disagreement of anyone that I talk to that that is a valuable goal. It is for my children and my grandchildren. It's easy in a military organization to be very disconnected from the real world uh, around you. And I learned that as a young fellow, as a grunt running around uh, Rockhampton, having things fired at me and uh, having all sorts of fun. Um, but the reality on the ground is, and, and we've seen it in real time play out globally with the PFAS incident, incident, which most of you will be familiar with and aware of, where if we don't pay attention to some of the basics and we don't pay, it, we, we will do damage because of lack of attention. And that's the sort of thing where large organizations, including governments, but specifically military, can through their own programs and by, through their own best practices have a material impact across a wide range of areas. And that will in, de in, in and of itself have a direct flow on effect to the people who live in those communities, to the people who live in those surrounding areas. So there's a number of things we can do and we'll go into them as, as part of what we're doing. But that's my opening thoughts. Thank you, Perry. And yes, I agree. Doing the right thing and making sure that we have somewhere we can live. So, Rafael, uh, I'd like to hear your perspective too, please. Yes, and thank you very much for, for having me and, and being there today. And I guess if you are there, probably you, you will agree with Perry and myself and our organization that is a very important topic. Uh, and obviously, to state the obvious, it's um, it's perceived as more and more critical by citizens across many parts of the world and by their governments. Uh, now, if we talk about you know, sustainability as a national security imperative, let me start by saying that lack of sustainability does threaten security, obviously. Uh, it threatens security when you have massive forest fires. Uh, it threatens security when you have floodings. It will, or it has started to, to threaten security if you have start to have conflicts over water supply, which might happen more and more. Um, and uh, I think it's fair to say that uh, military organizations are already uh, mobilized and contributing uh, to, to support citizens in dealing with the aftermath uh, of, the, of, the, of these issues, even in natural disasters. But I would like to, to, to go a bit further, because I think it's also the other way around, actually. Uh, my point is that, and, and Thales' point, is that we believe that there is no sustainability without security and stability. And unfortunately, I think the, the current Ukraine conflict gives a very obvious uh, demonstration of this. With the return of high-intensity conflict and war open warfare in, in Europe, what do you see? Uh, you see energy prices skyrocketing. You see the return to the use of coal uh, in Western Europe. You see issues uh, on uh, food supply. Um, and you see cyber threat, including uh, on, uh, on uh, utilities and energy. And therefore, we, we believe that these two topics of sustainability and security are intrinsically linked together. And therefore, the military and the defense industry and their partner have a role to play in fostering security to provide the right ecosystem for sustainability to flourish. And that's a very, for us a very important point in our purpose that Christian was gentle enough to mention, building a future we can all trust. And let me maybe add another thing, which is the security, of course it's physical security, 
but it's very much uh, digital security. And with the rise of digitalization and the exponential increase also uh, in connected device, both on the battlefield, but also in your pockets and everywhere, uh, we create more and more surfaces of attack, more and more cyber threats, including on our energy system. And therefore, uh, and I'll come back to it, there is an important role that uh, defense has, has to play to provide a safe energy transition to cleaner energy and distributed energy. Thank you. Thank, thank you, uh, Raphael. And it's clear that, you know, as governments or, and organizations are tackling ways to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, the military and defense and intelligence organizations will need to play their part too. Defense forces in several countries, including the UK and Canada, um, account for or comprise more than 50% of their federal government's emissions. And so more and more those organizations are expected and even pressured to think creatively about how they're going to help their governments achieve their sustainability goals. As uh, Rafael mentioned, he talked about natural uh, disasters and extreme weather events. And as rising seas uproot populations, there's mass migration events happening. There are climate-related refugee programs. And these things will then, in turn, challenge our borders and our infrastructures. Drought and threatened water supplies, agricultural challenges, they all impact our food supply as well. And that impacts people's livelihood and their ability to uh, find food and to feed their families. So climate change impacts crops, which of course then leads people to do things that they would not normally do. Uh, and that impacts national security. I would also say with the temperatures that are constantly rising, uh, across the world. That impacts troops in theater and it, it impacts their health and well-being. Military equipment is more likely to fail as a result of having to um, operate in these harsh conditions and we're even seeing that in many cases they'll have to be retrofitted or re-engineered to be able to operate in those conditions. So now that you've met our panelists, and thank you for your perspectives on, uh, on sustainability. I'd like to move to the next part of our session, which will be our uh, panel session. My first question, military, military organizations are typically huge asset and land owners. What are some of the sustainability strategies that they are or should be adopting? Rafael, let's start with you. Thank you, thank you, Christian. Well, it's true that uh, the defense industry, like uh, all of us and all of our industry, and, and the defense forces, of course, have a role to play in cutting emissions. You, you, you mentioned that uh, the, the, the military is an important emitter uh, within the federal government, and that's true, even if you have to put it into perspective uh, from the broad emission of society at large. Uh, and actually, many nations' defense forces have uh, policies to support the, the Paris Climate uh, Agreement. And they can do things. Huh? They, they can reduce their environmental footprint. They can go towards more clean mobility. Uh, they can use hybrid vehicles. They can work on the energy performance of the infrastructure. But I'll tell you the truth. And the truth is that uh, these people are risking their lives um, and that operational needs will always come first. Uh, operational needs are related to efficiency, to safeguarding uh, the, the, the lives of the soldier. Uh, will always come first. Having said that, it's true that in the specifications that we see uh, from governments, we see more and more uh, requirements that are environment, environment related and that are part of the evaluation of the offers uh, that we make. Uh, but first and foremost, they will require robust, reliable solutions uh, that protect the lives of the soldier and that are effective. Does that mean that there is very limited things that can be done? Actually not, because the biggest opportunity lies into reconciling sustainability goals and operational benefits. And actually there is a lot uh, into this. Uh, lighter equipment. Uh, for example, uh, our last, uh, our new Sophie thermal imager replaces uh, nine kilometer, nine kilometer, nine kilograms uh, device with 2.5 kilograms. 
uh, and when you transport it, that's much less emission. But even more importantly, also our last uh, radios, for example, uh, software-defined radios that go into a uh, uh, jet fighter, which have huge uh, carbon emissions, are lighter, and that also contributes. More energy efficiency. Our, la our latest radios, for example, software-defined radios, consume 20% less energy, and you need 15% less on the theater for, uh, for in actually increase usage. Stealth and discretion. So uh, we are actually replacing uh, some power train of vehicles with hybrid technologies, a bit for consumption, but actually also for silence, for discretion. Uh, it's actually an important feature. So the, the most effective and the, most, the, the shorter term is really about combining operational needs with sustainability benefits, and a lot can be done. And actually, uh, it's something that, that now is embedded into in our engineering. And we have a rule now in Thales uh, and a set of best practices that 100% uh, of our, on our new design shall be eco-designed, meaning that we take into account all these constraints, plus we turn them into opportunities for the benefits of our client. Thank you. And I, I think you hit on some points there where, you know, you're, you're really building this into the, the offerings that you're, you're manufacturing, et cetera. And more and more, I think governments are going to be looking for that in terms of what are our suppliers doing to be more sustainable? And are they doing, are they, uh, are they uh, measuring, recording reporting what they're doing to to the wider um, to the water wider audience and then are they also validating these things with third parties so thank you Perry yeah thanks very much I'd come at it from two angles I think in terms of my thinking around this particular problem in general uh, I believe in the little acorns become the uh, the big oak trees and I believe you have to solve the problem one heart and one mind at a time. Uh, we can come at it from a government perspective or a whole of defense point of view, but I think the policy gears and policy settings need to come from that level. But I believe one of the biggest ones is training and awareness of in your role that you play within the machine, within the organization, what are the expectations of the machine around you? And what priority should you give to those things? This might be as simple as I'm evaluating two vehicles. And I ask the Sarge beside me, what do you reckon, mate? And he says, well, that one gives off less emissions, but they're both as effective as each other. So I might give that a slight edge. My thinking around it is you're never going to compromise, and I 100% agree here, operational effectiveness is number one priority. Your goal is defense, that's your job. You're not going to compromise that for anything, including a few extra kilojoules of power or a little bit of extra. But that doesn't mean that these considerations can't be part of the matrix of deciding anything from where you source your power, what those power uh, and energy needs are. And let's face it, the power and energy needs of defense globally are enormous. So training and awareness uh, all the way back to military appreciation and indoctrination into the way of thinking from the military. If you get them at cadet stage and you start not creating zealots, but be creating aware people. I think that's the first fundamental starting block where I would begin what you're trying to accomplish. The second is to influence things like procurement. So you have a supply chain. At some point, we'll all create digital supply chains of equipment and everything else. What if the generalized vehicle architecture, for example, incorporated things like power effectiveness and power and environmental impacts and there was a set of uh, assessments provided down through that could be done as part of the assessment process. Again, it's not going to override operational effectiveness but it plays a role in the matrix of the decision making. So that's another area where I think there's a, a, a direct set of actions that could be taken. There's the obvious one of um, 
looking for innovations and creating SILs um, and innovation hubs focused on more effective weaponry using more eco-friendly methods. Electric rail guns come to mind as a classic. How do you power the electric rail guns? How do you get more investment in them? You make it worthwhile for industry to want to invest in it. And these are the, there, there's a thousand others and the, the point of innovation is that that's what you're looking for with part of the matrix being effectiveness through efficiency and power efficiency is going to be one of the massive ones. Uh, my last point would come into providing direct guidance to military staff and defense staff around what are the preferred power methods what are the parameters of the guidance from government to military? Is it nuclear? Is it, mi uh, is it micro-nuclear? Is it some other form of energy? What are your gears as government where you want to head, where we can do our job and perform our function within those guidelines? So getting those gears right from government down and starting to get the policy parameters right, I think is fundamental to this equation as well. That's Perfect. Answer. Thank you, Perry. So training and awareness so that they can get more uh, better informed decisions and then make the right decisions from a procurement perspective as well. On to our next question. As the pandemic raged on, the use of cloud became prevalent and it's clear that uh, it will continue to be used post-pandemic because of the benefits that we've seen from, a, from just a hybrid work perspective. And here now, you know, from a sustainability perspective, I'm thinking that cloud has benefits too. How do you think cloud can help address climate change and progress sustainability initiatives? Rafael, let's start with you. Yes, thank you. Uh, look, so obviously I'm not working for Microsoft, but I will confirm what, uh, what Christian said. <laughs> Basically, uh, our, our assessment and assessment of actually all cloud providers is that uh, Cloud is hugely more energy efficient than uh, on-premise uh, data centers, and it's in the range of 90% because there are huge economies of scale, because you use only when you need, because you mutualize, and because also since you centralize, you can, uh, you can make sure that you use the cleanest energy possible to, to sustain the data centers. And this is true for all society. Now, when you come to defense, um, well, let's face it, defense is, is a bit late on the adoption curve uh, than, uh, than the other industries, and for many good reasons uh, that uh, we can all understand related to, uh, to confidentiality, to, to security of the data, etc. Nevertheless, the interest is high, and it's part of our mission, part of our journey, to help our clients adapt uh, the cloud to their need and uh, let them uh, leverage all uh, the opportunities that come with the cloud. And actually, so if you look at the, at the military, at the defense forces, so they, they consume a lot of data and they will consume even more and more data uh, as we progress. And therefore, already starting uh, at the headquarter to adopt the cloud uh, is a source of energy efficiency. But it doesn't stop here, actually, uh, because we see that the cloud also can be used uh, on the combat theater, so if you want on the, the small HQ of the forces when uh, uh, they are deployed, for example, on the eastern borders of, of Europe, and even uh, at the far edge uh, within uh, vehicles, uh, be, be it uh, land vehicles, uh, navy or, or, or airplanes. And actually we are part of that. For example, uh, we have been recently selected by NATO to provide their first certified edge theater uh, cloud solution uh, that can be deployed in less than uh, 24 hours. And I'll come back to what I said earlier. You do have energy consumption benefits. You have uh, also benefits because it's much smaller form factor. So therefore there is a lot less things to move from the HQ to, 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 to the theater. Uh, and you have a lot of operational effectiveness benefits. Uh, so this is another good example of, you know, we will dry uh, environmental efficiencies uh, to the defense forces when we combine it with operational effect superior operational effectiveness. Perfect. I think it also comes down to, uh, again, building awareness around 
the fact that the cloud is secure and, and just helping to um, upskill and, and help defense and intelligence organizations understand that we've come a long way when it comes to security in the cloud. Perry. I agree with all those points. I would <laughs> just add one more, and that is to understand a problem, you have to be able to measure it. And to re find a, an answer to a problem, you have to not only be able to measure it, you have to be able to analyze it and do things with it. And in this context, if you take, for example, geospatial uh, satellite tracking data, we pull in two to three terabytes of change data each day. Uh, our product alone uh, pulls in that kind of scale of just pure change data from satellite imagery that is captured. Now this can be measuring temperature changes on a normal day-to-day -day basis, on a single day, or with hyperscale cloud, what you can now start to do is store things at a scale that is in the multiple, multiple petabytes. So now what you can start to do is actually look at those impacts over time and do the telemetry management to actually see what is occurring over a longer period of time. As we add more sensors, that's just a single sensor and the, and the satellite imagery. As we put more uh, ground-based sensor uh, elements in place, all those data streams can, back, can come back to something like Azure at the scale at which it operates. And you have, you, we have never been able to even have a chance of doing that from a technology perspective with on-premise. It's just physically absolutely impossible. And this is because part of what Hyperscale Cloud is doing is not just giving you lots and lots more disks. It's giving you a code-based approach to what used to be embedded in fixed methods, fixed hardware, and everything else. And what I mean by, I'll give you a concrete example. The interconnects between the 156 data centers that Microsoft runs that they own used to be run on Cisco switches that are physical switches and have a latency between them intercontinental. At a recent presentation I went to from the CTO of Microsoft, they are now moving the switch itself into code. And that is reducing the amount of interconnect time globally from 50 milliseconds down to one. Now what this means is that the data can now be stored geospatially, it can be stored where it needs to be. We can analyze Norway in Norway. We can analyze Europe in Europe. We can, we can then aggregate that data globally within the constraints of uh, security, geopolitical ownership of that data, etc. And this has never been possible before. And military in particular are able to and have a lot of the sensors that are unclassed that could contribute to this pool of knowledge. And it is a global pool of knowledge that we can tap into and look for those little nuggets of what's occurring, let's measure it, what can be done about it, how do we actually do that analysis, and then take action once you actually understand and have a plan of what you want to do. That's my thoughts. Perfect. Thank you, Perry. Can, if I can, can I just react or add something on the, the excellent point that Perry made? I think he also gave another example of combining operational benefits with sustainability, which is... If you start to distribute the cloud, then you start to store the data and distribute it where it needs to be. And I believe in defense, you know, you will go more and more towards distributed cloud, yes. towards the edge, and therefore you will avoid to bring all the data uh, back to the HQ, consuming a lot of uh, energy and bandwidth, and you will provide also better latency uh, to the forces. And therefore, it's, 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 I think, another example where we can combine the benefits. So, efficiency better efficient compute, better use of the data, better informed decisions. And when it comes to sustainability, there are also some significant research and development initiatives that are happening. For instance, Microsoft's project Natic, where we investigate operating a manufacturing and operating environmentally sustainable data center units that can be rapidly deployed and then are lights out for several years on the seafloor. And this is an example of sustainability uh, efforts to find new ways of cooling data centers. So on to our next question. What role does digital and data play to help us meet sustainability goals at large? 
Perry. So some of the interesting evolutions that I see, um, everyone talks about AI and it's going to solve so many things. And what's interesting is AI is actually pretty useless without the data because you've trained the model and it's going to be very fast at determining nothing. But those AI models when fed with accurate and useful information are phenomenal. I'll give you a concrete example. We use AI to do uh, ge um, genetic and biological research into patterns to find vaccines. Very good use of it, it's quite fascinating. That same model was inverted to look for pathogens using the exact same model but with the opposite goal and it found within a month 56 new pathogens that don't exist on the planet but are theoretically possible three of which are more deadly than anything that's ever existed on the planet. So this is what AI can do when fed the correct data and when fed useful information. So a key part of this is again, from my perspective, coming back to the data and defining the parameters and the policy gears of what we want to do with that data and what we should do with that data. So from a sustainability perspective, what it also then starts to give us, if we start pulling in geothermal sensor data, which is already available in many cases, but the analysis and the, and the aggregation of that data with AI over the top of it, looking for what are the more sustainable patterns that humans won't ever see, because they, the, they can't see the wood for the trees. There's just too much data. It's the, the, the classic cognitive overload. And in this sense, we can use AI at scale for looking for those, what are the sustainable elements, and building models out that look for specifically those things in the data itself. So that's a, a specific set of ideas. Thank you, Perry. And yes, I think from an AI perspective, um, one of the things that defense and intelligence organizations didn't have historically is the access to the scale and the capabilities that cloud provides and of course, that scale and capability is what's needed for them to be more agile, more, ad more adaptive, more resilient. And um, many public sector organizations have been gathering data for years, uh, but they haven't been able to extract the value of that data. And I think that with data and digitalization, because of the volume, the variety, the velocity at which this data is coming in, with the cloud, you now have the ability to analyze it and to make some informed decisions and to use AI um, effectively. So thank you, Perry. Raphael? Well, I, I, I fully agree with Perry. Um, I think if you think about the defense industry and their contri its contribution, uh, basically, uh, first and foremost, of course, uh, the digital and data allow to measure and then to improve, uh, for example, uh, emissions, also reliability, which has direct impact on sustainability. And this is quite obvious. But it also allows to go much further, um, notably with the development of simulation. So, for example, if I take uh, the example of the UK. In the UK, uh, basically, um, fighter planes account for two-thirds of uh, the emissions of the military. Uh, now, with the kind of simulation tools that uh, we develop for them, uh, they are on a path basically to reduce life flying for, for, for pilots, for, for training, to only 10%, and all the rest is simulation. And that will, of course, drastically uh, reduce uh, emissions. Now, coming back to AI, um, I think the example was quite frightening, I guess. Uh, <laughs> Uh, we, we believe we have a lot to bring on AI to the defense industry, but also to the society at large in the sense that uh, when you work in defense and you start to use AI, uh, there is a big question on, on how uh, this AI is used and is it, uh, will it do what it intends to do? Because uh, if it doesn't, then uh, there are life at stakes, definitely. Um, and therefore, uh, our approach is to make it safe to use AI 
by focusing on, a tech, on an approach which is called true AI, but the point is it must be valid, it must be explainable, it must be secure, and the, all the responsibilities uh, must be clear, and we integrate a human in the loop. And I think what is key for the military, if you think about what I said, I guess it's key in many other areas of the society to make sure that we have a sustainable AI uh, in our life. And the second point about AI is one thing that is important also for the military is that uh, actually they, they have much, much, much less computing power actually, you know. Now this is actually much more computing power than what they have typically in uh, vehicles. Uh, and airplanes, and so they need AI that is very low consumption in terms of energy. And therefore we develop a real expertise in what we call frugal AI, which is basically AI that is really uh, say, you know, providing results while consuming very little energy. And this also, if you bring back to broader usage in the society, uh, will be key. So if energy data, big opportunity, but with regard to national security, also a threat to manage. Uh, basically, now that warfare is hybrid, we can see that more and more, uh, you know, attack go through digital and data. Let me just give you a very recent example. At the start of the Ukraine conflict, um, the, the the Kassat satellites of, of Yasat were, uh, or the modems of the Yasat satellites of uh, uh, of the satellite of Yasat were attacked, shutting down their modems. And actually, uh, you had about. Uh, 150 wind farms or uh, windmills that were connected to the German uh, smart grids network through, through these uh, modems that were shut down from the network or disconnected. Um, and if you think about the, mu the, the, the energy transition, we'll have much more of, much more of these. We'll have much more wind farms, uh, much more uh, solar energy, and so we'll have a distributed uh, energy uh, infrastructure. And that means much more surface of attacks for cyber threats. And therefore, uh, it's a call for action for digital and data to provide the cyber solutions to protect this. And if not, we will have an energy transition that is not safe for our citizens. And we also in Thales, it's a big part of our focus to provide the solution for critical national infrastructures in order to provide a safe energy transition. Thank you, Perry. So yes, I, you know, I. I, uh, I'm glad you brought up the, the training and the simulation. I think it applies to even simulating cyber attacks and things like that in the cloud. And, and you know, reducing your um, dependence on physical assets to train your people, being able to leverage the intelligence and the capabilities of the cloud to do that. So thank you. Let's talk about digital engineering and how, how do you see the use of digital engineering in helping to meet sustainability goals. Rafael. Rafael. Yeah. Uh, look, it's a bit what I, like what I said on simulation. Huh? Uh, digital engineering provides the ability to create digital twins, which in turn uh, make it much easier and faster and avoiding physical prototypes to test uh, features. Um, while also cutting emissions from live testing. So again, operational benefits, faster development, better features, uh, less emissions. But I think if you think also about how engineer works, digital engineering provides the opportunity to basically facilitate the uh, use of components of the shelf, reuse of standard components, reinventing only what is uh, barely necessary which in turn, you know, uh, improve the total cost of ownership and in, in turn improve also uh, emissions. So from the high end prototyping to the, you know, more nitty gritty daily life of the engineer to be supported to really uh, use and uh, design only what's needed. Awesome. I like the idea of the digital twins because, you know, you can, you, can, you can learn, you can experiment, and you can quickly find out if something will work or not. And, uh, and that's, that's a more sustainable way of doing things as well. Perry, what are your thoughts on this one? I, again, I'm back to the individual. So people are driven by their passion. And digital engineering, if we can set up the constructs to give them access to the data, to be able to leverage a digital engineering uh, chain, and to tap into that, 
and we open source components of that, then people who are passionate about understanding how a particular parasite lives in an environment, people who are passionate about solar flares, the data per se will be useless if we can't use the digital engineering techniques combined with the, the passion of the individual to want to go and explore new and exciting areas. So we need to find a way, and this doesn't exist right now, and perhaps defense as such a, a, a large uh, holder of information could open up open source data combined with Microsoft to provide that digi digital engineering capability and actually let people explore and see what they find capable. If you look at things like uh, Google Earth, um, a lot of those ideas came from people being able to get the data and to exploit it and to do things with it. We will find the majority of people coming out of universities, a lot of spare time and a lot of passion behind them, they're the people who are going to actually go looking for things that they will find those little nuggets. So combining those three things, it's probably a little left to center for a normal defense and intelligence type space. But the open source and the OSINT data, why not? Oh, I like that. Let's talk about accountability and governance. Should military organizations and their suppliers be held accountable for their impact on the environment? And if so, what are your thoughts around how this could be governed, managed, and audited to measure progress. We'll start with you, Rafael. Yeah, I think the, the answer is obvious. It's very much so. Uh, maybe let me start by saying that the military organization and the defense industry is one of the most regulated in industries for very good uh, reasons. Uh, we have to comply with many uh, international laws and treaties, uh, export control regulations, we are audited uh, very regularly and it's very good. And it means that by nature and by culture, we, we do have the processes and the mindset to, to comply, to go beyond, to train, to audit. And it's not different for environmental regulation. Uh, and we have already started very much down that road. Um, let me just give you the example of what, what we do in, in Thales. First and foremost, uh, of course, there is the fight against global warming. Um, so compared to our 2018 baseline, we have reduced our emissions uh, by 35%, or we we'll have reduced them by 35% by uh, 2023, compared to initial target where we intended to be at uh, 20%. By 2030, we aim to, uh, to be at uh, 50% less than in 2018, and by 2040, we'll be net zero. Uh, but, you know, we have focused sustainability very much on, on, on climate, and that's fine. But there are actually other dimensions uh, mm -hmm. that we haven't touched. Diversity. I, th I think it's fair to say that, uh, for the military at least, uh, that there are organizations which at least from a... Uh, that, that has shown historically a, a way to uh, enroll people from diverse background, maybe not so much from diverse gender background. Um, and uh, we in Thales also have progresses to make. We have set ourselves objective to have at least three women in at least 75% of our management committees, to have at least 20% of women at the highest level of responsibilities within the group. And we track this, and it's part of all our discussion on human resources. Third dimension is ethics. Uh, so how do we compare with regulation? What do we do against corruption, etc.? It's very important into our business. It's also something we, we measure. We audit, and we have a zero tolerance possibility. Uh, policy. And the last dimension is uh, health uh, and safety. Uh, we have the objective to reduce workplace uh, incident and accident by 30% versus what we're hitting baseline. So basically the point is you can set objectives, uh, you can measure them. Uh, it must be holistic. Of course, climate is very high, but it's not the only dimension. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and in terms of the how, clear measure of the starting point, uh, clear objectives, Clear incentives, so uh, all people in Thales eligible to variable compensation, which is about 70%, have a good share of, uh, of these objectives tied to, to all that I've said before. Uh, and then a mix of big things, like changing design, but also a lot of continuous improvement things to make it happen. Thank you, Raphael. I'm just going to wait a bit. Animation permanente de 14h 
So that was your commercial break. Now we're back. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Rafael. And what I'm hearing from you is that, uh, yes, you can have sustainability goals and commitments that you're making within your company, but it goes beyond climate change. You have to take into, cont into, into account diversity for continuity and sustainability within, um, within the, the sector itself. So Perry, what are your thoughts on this? Yeah, thanks. I guess mine are slightly controversial in this space because I don't quite agree that accountability is the right phrase. The military will always work within the objectives set by government. That's, that's its role, its function, that's how it's defined and how it will operate. And so in this sense, I think if you had the most sustainable ballistic missile that was less effective than what your enemy has got, I think it's a pretty useless ballistic missile, frankly. And so I think there's a, um, there's a scale of priorities that government needs to set and what are the policy di directives that it's prepared to accept within that. And I think that would set the basis of how defense would then proceed. In that context, defense would still proceed and follow the same pathway of measure, assess, and report. And so the accountability element isn't so much uh, is defense accountable for the higher level objectives. It's not. Government sets those. It is uh, accountable for how compliant it is with meeting the objectives set by government. And so in that sense, I don't think accountability is quite right. I think it is way more nuanced. And I think we need in defense to be not losing that nuance. Uh, we live in a world currently where nuance seems to be lost very quickly and I think it's extremely important that we don't lose it in, in this context and in this conversation. Yes, I think agreed. I think accountability may be, accountable may be a, a strong word uh, because military organizations are in fact responsible for protecting uh, their countries. They won't necessarily always be using sustainable methods to do that. However, I agree that there are a certain level of commitments and things that you can do from um, from a real estate perspective, from a um, uh, from a, a fleet vehicle perspective, etc. There are some things there that you know because they're such huge asset and landowners. There's there are things that they can do there uh, and to meet those commitments and to, to make them a commitments and to meet them. So thank you. I think we have about uh, 12 minutes left. What I'd like to do now is to move to our uh, question and answer uh, period. So uh, I'm going to open it up. And we have someone here who has a question. Hi, Alex Meadows from Raytheon. Um, with the emerging technologies such as blockchain and quantum computing and networking being extremely energy hungry, how do we balance the desire to reduce consumption with the need to not thwart our efforts at innovation? Yep. Rafael, yeah. do you want to take this one first? Yeah. Um, basically, basically it, to a certain extent, it will balance itself quite naturally because um, you need to, to balance operational effectiveness, affordability, which is quite a, a, an important topic, uh, and of course sustainability. So for example, uh, quantum will be, will have some, some definitely some important implications, um, but not distributed everywhere on the battlefield. It will be in some, some very precise areas. Um, and so it would, won't be generalized uh, very, 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 very quickly. So I think th it's a balance. Uh, and I think, in, in, you know, high energy consumption is also high cost, often means uh, big fa form factor. So uh, 
create an high cost, yeah, creates limitation to, to the usage. So it's somewhat intertwined. Perry? It's a really fascinating one. I think it's one of evolution. We invent something new, blockchain. It requires massive amounts of GPU and huge amounts of power to run the thing. I've seen the designs inside Microsoft where they are reinventing that technology. So they've looked at what it does, they've looked at the mechanics of how it works, and they've already rewritten the algorithms that allow blockchain to work, and they've built it into SQL Server as an example. So SQL Ledger, which is GA now, it's out, uses those same techniques, but it uses 50,000 times less power. And so that what they're doing is they're, they're literally taking the concept and saying, yes, it's a valid and legitimate concept, and making it more effective, which is the normal evolution of we've invented something and, and we look for better ways. Uh, I totally agree that it does self-balance in the short term, and I think we, we in, humans are very good at adapting. We, we are terrible at many things, but at adapting, we are incredibly good. And one of the things that a company like Microsoft is doing in that space, and I don't know whether the other majors are doing it, I'm a Microsoft partner, I'll be blunt about that, I don't work for them, but I see the inside of the engine of the technology they're producing, and that I have seen. So I, I think that uh, it's self-course correcting in that sense. I agree with that. Thank you, Perry. Any other questions from our audience? No? I maybe have one more. Okay. All right. Um, Let me just get to this, hang on. Okay, so for organizations who want to be more sustainable, do you have any advice on how to get started? And what are the immediate opportunities for positive impact? Perry, we're gonna start with you on this one. Again, back to people's passion. Uh, that's where it sits. It starts with the individual, in my mind, and you get behind a concept and an idea and the organization needs to set the parameters for that. And, and in this one, I think there's broad effect of what does sustainability means, and it can mean small things. It can, can mean as simple as we have the eco bin in the corner. It can mean we're using the sensors and effectors to be able to sense uh, 50,000 meeting rooms across a government, an entire government, or maybe it's even higher, and to turn off the aircon when they're not in use. Detect. Uh, when someone walks in and turn on the aircon. So being more effective in the assets you have, understanding the power draws across those dynamics and using technology as a lever to improve the way you do it. I, I would say that's a very effective path. Yes, so what I'm hearing from you here is, is basically putting in place smart technology so that we can better use um, the energy in our, in, in, the, uh, in our buildings, in our areas of work. Rafael? Now maybe I would just add that I totally agree with the pe people that I mentioned. I think you can extend it, at least when you are a, a leading industrial player, to your suppliers. Uh, I mean, it's a responsibility, I think, of uh, leading firms like Thales to, to be at the forefront uh, of sustainability uh, in, in its industry. And therefore, it's also a responsibility to, to support, drive, help suppliers to contribute uh, because, of course, our environmental impact uh, is what we do ourselves, but very much also what our suppliers do. Um, and so we have a program to measure what the suppliers do, help them understand how to do better, and measure this. And it's part of, uh, part of our sustainability initiatives and what we get audited for. Uh, that's great. I think, you know, you're right. From, an, from, from a sustainability perspective, we have to look at the end-to-end -end chain in terms of making sure that everybody along the, along the chain of this, of a, a service or an offering has sustainable, sustainable practices. Okay, so I think we've reached the end of our session today. And I'd like to take a moment to thank you both, Rafael and Perry, for joining us today and for sharing your knowledge, your expertise with our audience. And I think it's fair to say that um, 
We face challenges that climate change brings, but we also face other challenges along the way around diversity, continuity, et cetera. Um, and defense and intelligence organizations do have the ability, I mean, it's not just about operational aspects. There are other areas where they can be sustainable. So they can put sustainability plans in place. And clearly there are areas um, where this can be done, where they can have commitments that they made. Um, so the last thing I wanted to say is uh, I, wa I want to thank you, our audience, uh, for being here today, for coming to our session. And we invite you to come and visit our booths. And you're, you see them here, so the Microsoft booth, fi Hall 5A, K350. Myriad Technologies is also there with us, and I think you also have a booth in Hall 6. Team Defense Australia. Yep. And in Team Defense Australia. Yep. And then uh, Talis um, has their booth here. It's just outside, isn't it? <laughs> I can't I, I miss it. <laughs> it's a bit bigger than the booth. But. <laughs> Um, so that wraps up our session for today, and I just I want to thank you very much for uh, for your attendance and for your participation. Thank you.